everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Abel, Chief Operating Officer here at American College of Healthcare Sciences. And thank you for joining us today for our Beyond the Cap Conversations in Complementary Alternative Medicine Conference. Before we get started with our next session, just a little housekeeping. Um, first joining us behind the scenes today is our technical wizard, Andy Pearson. He is running the GoToMeeting and will be available to assist any of you online if you need it. Um, for those of you joining us online, you'll notice that your line has been muted. We are recording today's sessions and we will be providing the recording and slides to everyone uh, who's registered for our event today. You'll notice if you're online that you also have a control panel at the right hand side of your screen. If you have a question during the presentation, please enter your question into the questions box and we will have time at the end for question and answers. If you have a more detailed question and would like to connect with the presenter, please send an email to info at achs.edu and we'll facilitate you getting in touch with Inga, our next speaker. Wonderful. Well, now I want to introduce you to ACHS graduate Inga Weiser. Inga is a graduate of our Associate of Applied Science in Complementary Alternative Medicine program, as well as a number of other certificate and diploma programs, um, certificates in homeopathy consulting, herbal retail management, natural products manufacturing, wellness consulting, and iridology consulting. She's also earned her diplomas in holistic health practice, herbal studies, and the, her diploma in aromatherapy. Inga is currently the president of the Professional Aromatherapy Organization Alliance of International Aromatherapists, and she was designated as our 2018 Famous Alumni, which is a program in partnership with our accreditor, the Distance Education Accrediting Commission. And Inga will also be speaking tomorrow at our graduation ceremony. Today, Inga will be sharing about the history and uses of CO2 extracts, and what they are, and how to use them in your aromatherapy practice. Welcome, Inga. Thank you very much. So CO2 extracts, we're going to talk about the history and production and some of the uses of CO2. But in an hour, we're not going to cover that much. So you'll just get a really brief overview. OK, um, I'm Inga Weiser. I'm a traditional naturopath. Um, I also have a master's degree in um, herbal medicine. Um, I currently run my own practice. As Tracy mentioned, I'm president of AIA. Um, I speak around the country, and I've been asked to teach at our local college. I've also been um, the hospital, our local hospital has called me numerous times to come and speak to their different support groups and um, because they have a real interest in CAM and they want to know what are some alternative things to do for different chronic um, conditions. So that's who I am. So our objectives today, we're going to look at what are CO2 extracts, we're going to look at how they're made, some of the differences and benefits between CO2 extracts and essential oils, and we're going to learn about a few different CO2 extracts. So this is called the CO2 rig. This is how CO2 extracts are made. This is a commercial rig, and this probably would process somewhere between five and 80 pounds of plant material a day. We'll look at, so you'll see some different examples throughout the presentation. So we have our history. Back in 1822 was when they first discovered what they call the supercritical phase. Now I'm going to explain that later, so I'm not going to go into that now, but that was the first, that's the very first beginning. Then um, back in 1880, that's when they started looking in and doing the research on how to use high pressure gases to produce different um, things. Then in 1960, 1970, Pfizer, which is a pharmaceutical company out of France, started looking at it um, to do pharmaceuticals. Um, they extend, extended the research, but never really went on to use it. Um, in 1980, Germany um, started using CO2 extracts in extensively um, and producing them, and it was all for the fl food flavor industry. And so they started really using those to flavor foods. Um, once they got that, then they started using it to take the caffeine out of coffee. That was very successful. Then their next two projects were taking some of the bitter compounds out of hops, and then also taking um, nicotine out of tobacco. Today, you could do just about any plant material, whether it's liquid or solid, as a CO2 extract, as long as it has volatile components 
And the cannabis industry is really making a huge difference in the cost and manu manufacturing because most of the cannabis industry, CO2 is, um, is the CO2 extraction process is what they're using. And they're driving down the CO2 rigs and the cost of it, making it much more accessible um, to companies to use. If you do cannabis, you can usually make back your price in about a month of the machine, even at $80,000. Okay, so this is what's happening when you have a CO2 rig. Over here, oops, wrong way. I'll get back to where I wanted to be. So over here where you have this R, that's your tank. That's CO2 in a liquid form. Then you come, this is not really showing up well enough. Then you come down here, you're gonna set your pressure. Then you come across, you're gonna set your temperature. It's gonna go here is where you're gonna keep your plant material. It's gonna go through your plant material. It's gonna come out up there. That's where you're going to start. Um, that's where you're gonna decide what's gonna come out, what you're going to keep, okay? Then that fluid's gonna come across here and drop in this reservoir. This is where your CO2 is gonna come out here. Okay, after it separates out, then it's going to go back through a valve. It's going to turn back into, it's going to lower the pressure, lower the temperature. It's going to turn back into a liquid. And it's going to come back into this tank to be used again. About 99.998 something percent of your CO2 is recovered. So that's an excellent recovery rate. You can use it again and again. Okay, so what is CO2 extraction? It's carbon dioxide, which is a solvent. Solvent is used to pull something out. So you have the solvent, it's going to pull out what you determine, okay? You have, it's also referred to as a supercritical fluid CO2 extract, or you'll see these initials, SFE, which just stands for the supercritical fluid extract. CO2 is the most common solvent used because it's one of the cheapest ones to use, okay? It's highly efficient. It's very selective. You can select what chemical constituents you want pulled out, what chemical constituents you want left in. Um, it's eco-friendly. You're not causing any danger to the environment. You keep pretty much everything intact. Um, you can use it today on liquids, solids. You can use it for spices. You can use it for herbs. You can use it for liquids, such as fruit juices, which is used really highly in the food flavoring industry but you can also use it on most of your base oils. And so you will see the option not only of finding essential oils of CO2 extracts, you'll also see it as an option of finding vegetable, nut oils as a CO2 extract, okay? So what is supercritical extraction? So here we're changing CO2. CO2 usually is found either as a gas, which is carbon dioxide. You may have carbon dioxide monitors in your house because you know that it kills you. if You have too high a concentration. The other solid form is dry ice. And that's what it is when it's solid. It hardly ever is in between. It's almost always a gas or a solid. It isn't a liquid. If it's a liquid, you're having to hold it in that suspension state by some other process, okay? So when we use it to extract things, we're using it in a liquid state. We're using it in a liquid state as it kind of transitions between the liquid and the gas and back to the liquid. And it's super critical is the state that you want. And if we go on, you see this um, presentation. So here you have CO2 gas. Here you have dry ice crystal solid. This is a triple point. This is um, just about 220, 15, 20 bars of pressure and just under, um, or just under 10 bars of pressure and at um, 210 degrees Kelvin, which is approximately 20 degrees Celsius, okay? And this is where you're gonna find CO2 in all its phases, liquid, gas, and solid. But this is what we call the critical point. This is where it's going from gas to a liquid to a supercritical point. When it's in the liquid is when you get a subcritical 
extractions. And you will have subcritical extractions as a, um, they will be listed as a CO2 extract. Once it passes this point, it's a supercritical fluid. It draws out much heavier components and that supercritical condition is like a really dense fog. It's about halfway between a liquid and halfway between a gas. So that's when they say supercritical, that's, this is the range, this yellow range here, yellow orangish range is the range that they're talking about. And it's that range in between a gas and a liquid. And you hold it there by regulating the, the temperature and regulating the pressure, okay? So we have a subcritical CO2 extract, and you are going to keep your temperature below 31 degrees Celsius. You're going to keep your bars of pressure below 80 bars of pressure. And that's going to be the one that's closest to an essential oil. <coughs> it's going to carry off molecules that are as heavy as a carbon 20. And you will see some um, diterpenes come out in essential oils, but you don't see a lot. Once you get to that C20, they're getting heavy and they don't come through very well in steam distilled. They're too heavy, they fall back down. Did you need something? I was going to actually have you put some extractions. It wasn't sure. Yeah. Oh, I want it out. Well, see, you can see it on the wall, but yeah, you can't, can't really see it. There it is. Yeah. It's there, but I don't know oh, that you can see it. There's not enough contrast in the middle of the background. Yeah. I know, I did try. <laughs> That's okay. So, um, so when you're using a subcritical CO2, it's going to be very, very similar to a steam distilled essential oil. When you have a select, you're going to pull out just a bit more. You're going to pull out just a bit heavier um, molecules. You're going to get up to a carbon 25. Carbon 25, you would not find in essential oils. So you're going to see that you're going to start changing the difference between what you see in the essential oil and what you see in the CO2 extract. And you can get a total or a complete CO2 extract, and you're going to pull out carbon molecules all the way up to carbon 60. So you can tell that those are a lot heavier. Because mostly in essential oils, we're at um, sesquiterpenes, we're at carbon 15. We're not this high. It, they're just too heavy, they would drop down. They would never get carried through with the steam. Okay? So, and you can see that as we change our pressure, we change what we pull out. We also are changing our temperature. Here we're keeping it at 31 degrees. Here we're between 40 and 60. Here we're between 40 and 80 degrees Celsius, okay? Okay, here's a really small one. This is from the uh, Apex company in Ohio. They're the biggest maker of CO2 rigs in America. I got a chance to tour their factory. Um, this is a desktop model and it will um, process between one to two pounds of plant material in a 24-hour period. They are no longer selling it. They're phasing it out. They still take, if you buy any CO2 rig from them, you can take it back and turn it in and get 75% of the cost that you paid for it. This, this would go for $40,000. Um, if you turn it back in, you get 30000 credit on whatever you buy next. Yes? Just out of curiosity, I know you said you don't make it anymore, but as a desktop model, how big is that? Hard to tell from the picture. It's probably about this big, oh, about about this that high. Big. Okay. It's Let's probably see. about this wide. Okay. So it's it's about Takes three quarters of the table, table. Yeah. and okay. probably about two and a half feet high. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so then their their next size does between five and 180 pounds of plant material a day, and it's 120 thousand. So there's a huge price difference. So. Okay. So. These are my personal critiques on CO2. I am not an expert. I've taken several classes and I've read a little bit about it, but there isn't a lot published because this is really a new field as far as interfacing with the aromatherapy field, as far as interfacing with the perfume, with the food and flavor industry, with the cannabis industry, it's not such a new field. But in our industry, it's a, it's a you know, we're on, you're on the cutting edge, so you guys get to make the rules and set the things. So these are some of the things that I have discovered. So these are just my personal thoughts on CO2. So CO2 extracts start to blend 
the herbal world and the aromatic world, because you start to see the heavier molecules coming through that you would have in the herbal world, but you would never see in the aromatic world because they're too heavy. So we, we're starting to blend the difference between the two, okay? Um, in the industry, a lot of times if you buy a CO2 extract, it does not tell you whether it was a subcritical, a select, or a total. And that is really to your disadvantage because then you don't know what plant material it's carried through. So it's gonna make a huge difference for you to know that. And unfortunately, a lot of companies that are getting on the bandwagon and selling them, they don't give you that information because they don't really know it. So you need to be careful. You need to ask if you can have a COA. A COA is a certificate of analysis. I'm gonna go through what that is in just a minute. So I'm not gonna take the time at the moment. But if you have that, then you know what plant constituents that you're working with. So that's gonna make a difference in how you use it. And then lastly, you know, we don't really have any companies producing CO2 for just the aromatic world. What happens is people, for the most part in the United States, is they have rigs to do cannabis, but they may have peppermint growing wild, or they may have some other plant around. And so they know that it's up and coming in the aromatic world. So they will send it through and then they'll sell it. And unfortunately, we don't have I don't know anybody that has CO2 rigs that are specifically producing CO2s in America for the aromatherapy industry. So um, it's something, it's an area that really needs to be explored. It's wide open. It's an area that would be very, um, it'd be a fun area to work in. I mean, you would be leading the way in this new development. So, so those are some of my thoughts. So what is a COA? I said I would talk about that. A COA is what they call a certificate of analysis. And you all know about a GCMS, you know, the gas spectrometry, but that only takes the really light um, constituents and can tell you what they are. So you need something that's gonna measure the heavier constituents. So you're gonna use what they call a high performance liquid spectrometry, which is a HPLC. And that's going to isolate and identify your heavier components. That way you'll know what type of lipids and waxes and pigments that you're gonna have in your um, final product, okay? And you still would wanna use it with your MS, your mass spectrometry. Okay, so we have these heavier constituents. Um, and in order to know what you're really working with, if you have that COA, then you're gonna have that um, information. Um, and you're not gonna have it if you just buy it off the shelf and you never get it. Because one company that does it is not going to be the same as another company because it's not standardized. They may not use the same temperature, they may not use the same pressure, so they're gonna pull out different constituents. So even if you buy one that says CO2 select from company A and you buy a CO2 select from company B, you may not have the same constituents because they may have used different parameters that they set their, their CO2 rig to. Does that make sense? So when you get more towards the total, it's gonna to come out real thick like this. And a lot of times that's what they do is they put them in syringes and squirt them out, which is very different than your um, liquid, CO, uh, liquid steam distilled essential oils. Okay, so we're gonna look at some of the differences and some of the benefits. So here we have our list of essential oils on the right, and we have our list of CO2 extracts on the left, and we're just gonna compare them. So in essential oils that are steam distilled, you have all volatile oils. In CO2 extracts, you have both volatile and heavier components that are not considered volatile, okay? Um, essential oils are always done with a lot of heat. You only get steam if you have a lot of heat. When you're doing a CO2 extract, you're gonna work at much lower temperatures. Okay, so you're not gonna, you're not gonna have the possible um, degradation of the plant material through the, the process of getting your steam distilled oil like you would have in the steam distilled. Um, you can, in essential oils, you can use both plant, uh, fresh and dried material. In the CO2 extract, you must use dried material. In fact, when I went to the Apex factory, 
they have a drying machine and they won't run any plant through their CO2 rigs unless they put it in the dryer for 24 hours. That's how concerned they are about having moisture um, because that will destroy the rigs. Okay, um, you know, within the essential oil industry, we're pretty standardized. I mean, if you get from a reputable dealer, you know, if you get a time, time wall, um, essential oil, and it's a reputable dealer, it's pretty much going to be the same from every dealer that you buy it from. Now, if you don't buy it from a reputable dealer, it's adulterated again, you're not going to know what it is. But if you buy it from a reputable dealer, you know pretty much what you're getting. When you buy the CO2, you don't know what you're getting. So you really need that certificate of analysis. There's no standardization. There's no, there's nobody saying, well, we found that if we run time at 34 degrees Celsius and at 127 degrees bars of pressure, that's going to give us the most ideal range of constituents that are going to be the most medicinally active in our, our thing. Ann Hardman, I don't know if you know her, she's out in Washington State and she's done She's doing all this research on hydrosol. So what we need is we need somebody who's doing the same thing with CO2 extracts, where they're really, you know, they're they're producing them just for the the aromatic medicinal world, and, and so they're figuring out what is the most ideal. Do we want a few more bars of pressure? Do we want a few less bars of pressure? Do we want a few more degrees of temperature? Because all of that changes what's pulled out. Okay, typically they're cheaper for essential oils. And typically they're more expensive for CO2s. Actually, CO2s are easier, cheaper to make, but the cost of the machinery to start up is so much more expensive. So they usually sell them for more, more cost. Okay, um, shelf life of essential oil tends to be short and mostly the most common problem is that they oxidize. With a CO2, the shelf life is much longer. The average shelf life is between 10 or 15 years, depending on who you speak to and the chances of oxidation are very, very slight. Um, and that's because of the constituents that they pull out, we'll go into that. So you have many options for buying C, uh, essential oils. You don't have very many options for buying um, CO2s. In fact, I think Doreen had a little bit of a hard time finding CO2s to have here today for demonstration. Just to be certified organic. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and here you have that essential oils may oxidize during processing, and here you have that they are not going to oxidize. They're not, they're, you know, they're not exposed to any oxygen, so there is going to be no oxidation during the process. Phase, um, advantages of CO2s. So they're extracted at a lower temperature, so you're not going to have any temperature um, degradation. They are which can be very nice, especially if you're paying a lot of money. The aroma and taste is closer to the real plant material. And you're going to experience that when I pass some of these around. There's no oxidation during the process. You have a higher yield of the product. So the amount that you can get out is going to be a much greater percentage than when you do steam distilled oils. And you have a greater variety of chemical constituents. And you can set that up to get just the chemical constituents that you want. And I didn't put it here because I found conflicting information. One of the coming authorities in essential oils or CO2 extracts in the aromatherapy world say that it's great to do them because you can get all the pesticides out and it doesn't matter whether you buy organic or non-organic. Another person that's kind of big in the CO2 world says just the opposite. Never, never, never use a CO2 that's not organic because it will pull all the pesticides through with everything else. I don't know which is true. So I will just give you what I've heard, what I've learned, and you can take it for what it's worth. I don't know what, what is the correct answer. So what are the disadvantages? The cost of the equipment is obviously much higher. You know, you can buy something to distill one or two plant, uh, pounds of plant material for a lot less than 40,000. You can do 10 pounds of plant material for a lot less than 120,000. So you can see that the setup cost is much higher. Um, generally, they cost more, but as I said, that's not consistent. Um, you have a much more intense odor and smell. 
to some people that's a disadvantage, to other people it's an advantage. I couldn't decide where to put it. Um, most CO2 extracts are processed by companies that are just doing it as a side. That's not their major focus. You know, they're either into the perfume world, they're either into the food and flavoring world, or they're into the cannabis world. So what they do when they do other plant materials and some of the CO2 extracts to the aromatherapy world is just as a byproduct. It's like, oh, well, we want to make a little bit extra money. We got, we got some time to run on the rig, so we'll put this material through. So what are the additional chemical constituents that you typically find are you find the waxes, and that's what gives the plant the real shiny um, coating on the leaves um, that help protect the plant. And those waxes will come through. You tend to find the fatty acids. The fatty acids are gonna give you your greatest additional medicinal value. Um, and that's all depending on which fatty acids the plant has and how it was set up to which ones come through. And you're gonna get the pigments. So you're gonna have much richer colors and, you're, and the, the smell is gonna be much more like the real plant smell. And we're gonna smell some so you can see the difference and contrast that. But as a group, yes, Holly? Do, do the CO2 extracts pull out the vitamins and minerals? CO2 extracts do not pull out vitamins and minerals. So they, so they don't contain those? Either. They do not contain those. I wish they did. That was one of my, <laughs> that was one of my one first questions. <laughs> Um, but as a group, the pigments are, you know, when they tell you to eat well, to pick all those foods that are rich, that are vibrant in colors, that's because they have all the pigments, which are your um, flavonoids. And your flavonoids as a group are um, strongly anti-inflammatory um, and antioxidant. And it's that antioxidant characteristic that gives them such a longer shelf life. So you have two things. You have the antioxidant characteristic, which increases the shelf life, and then you don't have access to any oxygen in the process, so you don't have any of that de degradation when you're producing it. Yes? Question online from Margaret. She's asking, how much longer is the shelf life of CO2 essential oils compared to steam distilled essential oils? Well, most, the shelf life of most CO2 essential oils is around 10 to 15 years, depending on who you speak with whereas most essential oils do not have that long a shelf life, you know, depending where you're talking about citrus, which is shorter, maybe two years. But then you have something like vetiver, which lasts for a long time, <laughs> so. Okay, so um, this is the company in Germany that did the most um, Flavex. They did the most for really bringing this whole process into being, and that's why you have so many other companies using it. That's why the cannabis industry has really taken off. So this is um, this is from their website. This is the picture. And you can buy them from there, and they do do a lot of organic ones. And if you do use, you know, if you're, I'm into both herbs and essential oils, so I love both. But like if you're making tinctures and they taste terrible, if you get a CO2 extract of vanilla or coffee, or orange, you can make your um, tincture taste really great. You haven't added anything that's going to be, that's going to compromise it from the alternative point of view. You haven't added any calories, and you've just added more medicinal, um, you've given it more medicinal qualities at the same time of, of helping with compliance with your client being more interested in taking it or if you do lymph bombs or anything that you want to taste. They have a great, you know, there's some really great advantages to all of these. So how do we use CO2 extracts and how do we use them safely? So CO2 extracts, it, extracts if they're the subcritical, they're going to be pretty much just like a steam distilled essential oil. You can use them in exactly the same way. The only slightly difference is that you very rarely get the diterpenes and essential oils in here, they would be more common. But it would still be everything that you would find. There wouldn't be any different components, you're just gonna get more of the heavier components that are, are more rare in steam distilled essential oils. In the supercritical, either in the select or the total, you're gonna have quite a different array of 
chemical constituents. The closer they are to the um, subcritical point, the closer they are to your steam distilled essential oils. Once you add more temperature, more pressure, you pull out heavier components. And again, your certificate of analysis is going to give you your best idea of how to use them. For the most part, if they do sell it to you as a select, am I in your way? They do sell it to you as a select, pretty much you can use it one for one of whatever you would have used in essential oil. Okay. If you get a total, it's going to be very different. First of all, a total probably will not pour. Sometimes it's liquid, but most of the time it's too solid, so it won't pour, and I'm gonna show you that later. Um, so you're going to have to mix it with, usually you mix it with a, a nut oil or a vegetable oil um, and you dilute it and then you would use that. Um, but for the most part, totals are more um, solid. They're not a solid mass, but they're too solid to pour. Okay. Um, and you can use them in all the combinations that you typically would make products using essential oils. You can use them for um, topical inhalation and internal. Um, if you're using the total extract, it's not going to work well for inhalation, but if you're using the select or the subcritical, then it will, would work just the same way. Okay. So let's go through some of these. And I'm going to give you a chance to smell the difference and see the difference between the two. Because remember, we picked up more pigments so the colors are going to be different, and we've picked up um, the smell is going to be different. Okay, so here is the ginger CO2. And here is the essential oil. And Molly's going to help me out. And I just, I didn't label, I did, I did label CO2 and essential oil so you can smell the difference. So these are the ginger that are going to come around first. And somebody has a tissue or a paper towel. I don't want to stain their table, and I did get a big drop. Okay, thank you. So let's look at ginger. So in this case, you can find both the select and the total, but the total is going to give you your best medicinal quality. Okay, so it's the one that you would really want to use. So if you're looking for a ginger CO2, ask for the total. It will come out liquid, so it is something that you can actually um, use. Now, the unique characteristics or constituents that you're going to find um, in the total are your gingerols and your sh chogorols. And um, your gingerols are going to get is what gives it the really spicy uh, flavor. That's what gives it the real smell. Um, and they're known to be anti-inflammatory uh, anti and also anti-rheumatic. And so it's going to help. And then your sholigols are going to be a really strong antihistamine and prokinetic. So it's going to um, stimulate that peristalsis of the GI tract. As a group, those two as a group, they are antioxidant, antihistamine, prokinetic, and anti-inflammatory. And the way they work on the inflammation system is on the COX-CO2. It inhibits that enzyme and the inflammatory process. So applications, we have chronic bronchitis, colds, flu, joint inflammation, fibromyalgia, stiffness, pain, arthritis, deep bone and tumor pain, cold extremities, cold circulation, nausea, cramps, and bloating. And this is probably one of your best ones if you have like the mold disease and you really have those cold fingers and toes and you don't get that circulation. So if you wanted one particular, um, well, we still call it an aromatic oil, but it, it would be the CO2 ginger total extract. That's where you're going to see it. This is from um, Eden Botanicals, and they do provide a certificate of analysis. It was hard for me to find companies that provided them, so I tried to find some examples. Um, so this gives you an example. And you can see here, for your total sum of your gingerals, 
you've got 24%. So that's a pretty high percentage of those um, constituents, okay? And then you have, of that total CO2 extract, you're gonna have 45% is going to still be what you would see in a regular um, essential oil, steam distilled essential oil. Okay, next we have German chamomile. And I'm gonna pass those around. And I do not, I'm sorry, I don't have the essential oil. I only have the CO2 extract. But most of you know that the essential oil is, okay, here's one where, see, I can tip it upside down. That's oh, awesome. Oh, <laughs> and I can pass around the bottle, but you can see um, it's, it's like a soft wax. That's, that is the consistency. So, so when you have a CO2 extract that comes out in this form, and most of you probably know that German chamomile is a really beautiful blue when you get it as a distilled CO, uh, when you get it as a distilled essential oil. Um, here, I'll just pass this around too. But it's not, it's not normally blue. It's the, when you steam distill the essential oil, um, that heat is what changes um, matricin into the camazuli, which is the really blue. So actually, it's from um, the process. It's not something that's normally in the oil, okay? But, and it, it is that camozulin that makes it so anti-inflammatory. But if it stays in its original form, it's a matricin. According to Mark Webb, who's done lots of research, he's out of Australia, he says that it's 10 times stronger as an anti-inflammatory than your camazulin. That's a huge difference. Yes. So if you want something that's a really, really strong anti-inflammatory, this is your product. It's probably the strongest one on the market. Okay? And that's because you keep it there. Some of the other things that you really get is you get a lot of the alpha bisabolol, and that's going to really enhance all your skin healing issues. So it's good for protecting your skin, it's good for environmental damage against your skin, and it's good for healing wounds as well as being anti-inflammatory. So some of the applications we have are anti-inflammatory, analgesic, calming, soothing the nerves, antihistamine, antispasmatic, and wound healing. So it's a really great one. Yeah? Can you still ingest it? You can. You just would need to use the same, um, the same precautions that you would use for any essential oil. And when an essential, when that CO2 extract is like this, what you would need to do is you would put whatever you're going to need to dilute it. You can't really use it in that form. So you would take your CO2 extract, you would take whatever vegetable or nut oil that you want. So say you wanted to put it in um, sweet almond olive. So I would put both of them in a water bath, heat them up so that they stay the same temperature, and I mix them a one to 10 ratio. So basically you have 10%. Mm -hmm. So if you know you have one ounce in that bottle, then I would take nine ounces of um, sweet almond oil, heat them both up together, then just pour your German chamomile in the sweet almond oil and shake it vigorously so that it spreads and, and dilutes through the whole amount. And then, you could... and then you could take that internally. You could take that and add that to your product. You know, I do a lot with an herbal infused oils. Um, and so instead of taking the time to do the herbal infusion, then I would, you know, into my base oil, I would just use the CO2 extract in my base oil. Okay. And so here it's also from Eden Botanicals, and it gives you another list of um, some of the uh, um, constituents that are drawn out. Okay. 
And here you can see the um, alpha, yeah, the desirable is 23%. That's pretty high. You're never going to see that in the regular essential oil. Okay. And you do see that a little bit of camazuline came through. You still have 1%. So that's unusual. Usually you don't see any. But in this particular one, you do. And that's why it's really nice to look at them because you can see differences that happen. So they may have done it at a higher temperature than what's typically done. Okay, so we have rosemary. Rosemary is really unique. You know, I just picked a variety just so you could kind of see some different things. But rosemary is really different because it comes in a select CO2 and usually it's from the um, chemotype um, um, cineal. It's the chemotype cineal. But it also comes in what they do, a fractionated antioxidant. And you will see it much more as a CO2 fractionated antioxidant than you will ever see it as a CO2 select. Okay? So when you do the CO2 select, you don't really get any unique chemical constituents that come across. But what you do see is that you get a much higher rate of the 1,8 cineal will come across. So your percentage of 1,8 cineal will be much higher than in your steam distilled. So your antimicrobial effect will be greater. But again, then you have to take into account the safety issues because once you have a higher 1,8 cineal, you're going to have more safety issues that you're going to contend with. So you just need to take that into account. So here's a CO2 select that you probably would use slightly less than a one-to-one -one ratio if you were using it in a product. Okay, yes. So can you, can you diffuse these and keep the dilution down just like you would essential oil? You could. And you don't. Be more effective? Would it be stronger? Depends on what you want. You know, it's not, CO2 extracts aren't necessarily stronger than essential oils. They're just different. In this case, you do have a stronger steam distilled constituent that comes across on a much higher level. But it's, un, it's unusual. Typically, that's not the case. Did that answer that question? Yes. Yeah. OK, so applications are going to be very similar to what you would find in a regular steam distill for the select. You know, it's going to be uplifting. It's going to reduce stress. It's going to be stimulating. It's going to relieve cognitive and mental fatigue. It's going to help with concentration. It's going to help with memory. Now let's look at the antioxidant. Well, let me pass some of these around. I don't have the CO2, um, um, CO2 regular select, but I do have the antioxidant and I do have the regular um, essential oil. Oh, this one's solid too. This one is, you can see the difference. It won't pour out, but can you see that drip? How it's real slow, so it, it almost drips. Okay, I'll give you that. And then let me give you an essential oil one. So if I were to turn this one out, it would actually still. And we don't have the CO2 select, we just have the antioxidant. And what I do is you do not use the antioxidant in, in the same way that you would substitute a regular CO2. What I do is I use it as a natural preservative. So I tend to add six drops to one ounce and I have that preservative effect, especially when I'm doing creams or lotions or anything where I have some type of water base in my product and it will protect it from molding and going off. I'm, I'm sorry, which, which one? Can the, use? Antioxidant the antioxidant one. And you can also get, we're, we're doing rosemary, but you can also do sage in the same way. Mm -hmm. But you probably know from your herbal studies that sage and rosemary have a lot of similar characteristics. Okay. So the antioxidant is a subcritical. So remember how we talked about that blue area 
where the um, CO2 is just in a liquid form. So they use it as a subcritical fractionated. They pull out only the antioxidant characteristics. Remember how I said they took out the nicotine from tobacco? So you can take just one chemical out of a plant, subtract it and have all the rest come through, or you can just take one chemical out and have that as the only chemical constituent which comes through. So here, when they do the sage or the rosemary, they fractionate it so just your antioxidant constituents come through. Nothing else comes through in, in your um, final product. And it makes it a really strong antioxidant. And if you, yes? A question online from Julia is asking, is CO2 rosemary extract more efficient topically than the essential oil? The question was, is CO2 um, antioxidant more, what was the word? Efficient? Efficient topically. Topically than the uh, um, essential oil. Typically, you would not use a fractionated CO2 rosemary as a topical. You would use it more as a preservative. Although you could add it into a topical product, I would not use it by itself. But you could always add it into a topical product because it does have some, it does have some medicinal characteristics. Okay, it it produces um, diterpenes, diterpene phenols, the carcinol and the carcinin, carcinol, and can't say the word, the acid form of that, and those are the two that are the really strong anti oxidant, but they do have that antioxidant proper, per, um, property and they also have anti-inflammatory and they're known to really help with anti-aging because anti-aging is we lose the bot, we lose in our bodies that ability to keep taking care of all the free, free radicals that we build up over time that we take in from the environment. And so anytime you have an antioxidant, basically what you're doing is you're helping your body deal with that free radical. You have, you have a chemical component that will donate and stabilize that free radical. That's what an antioxidant is. And so it is, going, it is something that can really help skin, um, anything that you use for skincare products, because you're going to reduce that aging effect. Does that, do you know if that answered your question? Yes. So it's good for skin care issues. So not only can you use it as a preservative, but if you have acne, ec eczema, genitis, those would all be other products that would typically be skin care products, but now you can also add the antioxidant and um, see the difference, okay? So here's our um, certificate of analysis, again, from Eden botanicals um, and you kind of see what's in there. So next we're going to go to turmeric. Turmeric's kind of surprising because you know turmeric's gotten all this um, publicity about what a great um, herb it is and it is. Well, don't, don't, don't think I'm saying it's not. It is a great one and you would think with the CO2 extract that you would really pull off a lot of the cumin in but you don't. Um, the coumadin doesn't come through your typical um, CO2 extract, okay? But it's really high in the tumorones. The tumorones haven't been studied near as much, um, but some of the initial studies coming in are showing that they are probably just as effective as the cum um, curcumin. I can't speak today. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's still in its early research. But they do know that the tumorones um, are the um, enhancers, um, pre-meditation enhancers of the curcumin. Okay. And so what what I've read is that if you take the steam distilled essential oil and the CO2 and you mix them 50-50, you're gonna have a much stronger product than if you use either one alone. Because you're gonna really add so many more of the tumorones, which are going to make the curcumin so much more um, medicinally active. Okay, and so this is, you know, this one gives you an example of a CO2 extract that actually produces 
totally different constituents than what you would imagine from knowing the essential oil or the plant that's in, in the herbal world. So let me let you smell some of these. And I hope you're noticing the color differences between the two. And you know, you wait till you have them together so you can see the color and the smell. Because they're really quite different. Okay, so here's your um, certificate of analysis. And you can see your tumorones are at 64%. So that's a pretty high um, rate of um, tumorones. But your curcumin is at less than one tenth of 1%. So you can see that's pretty low. <laughs> so clove is our next one. Clove comes in select. Um, but what's interesting about clove is even though you do it as a um, CO2 extract, you still end up with about 90% as still essential oils. Um, and you're going to have some of your fatty acids and you're going to have your waxes that are going to come through. Waxes are going to be the first thing that comes through when you go to have your mouth feel. You're going to have less of the eugenol that you usually have in steam distilled, but you're going to have a much higher rate of your very uh, caryophylline, and you're going to also have a higher rate of your um, eugenol acetate. And because you have a lower eugenol and you have higher of these other constituents, it's going to make it much gentler than your regular steam distilled clove oil. It's going to make it stronger as an anti-inflammatory, and it's also going to increase its analgesic effects. So um, it's actually a safer oil to use than your steam distilled because of the, how it changes those chemical constituents. So it's going to be relaxing, analgesic, a local anesthetic, antispasmatic, so antiseptic, a strong one, strong antibacterial, and it's good for both germ positive and our gram positive and gram negative bacteria. It's a strong antifungal, it's neuroprotective, and it's an antioxidant. So this is one case where your clove is going to actually be, you're gonna get a gentler one than you are with the steam distilled. It's gonna be, it's gonna have less safety issues. So here's your constituents. Um, this is from Nature's Gift. So now you can see at least a couple of companies that have um, CO2 extracts where they give you your certificate of analysis. And our last one is calendula. And calendula is not one that you ever see as an essential oil. And the reason you don't see it as essential oil is that it only produces between 0.8 and 1.5% essential oil. So it wouldn't be worth it to steam distill it to get any essential oil out of it. So you're not, you're, even though calendula is an aromatic plant, you're not going to get um, essential oils. But what's interesting is that, you know, you probably have heard of from the herbal world that, you know, if you take calendula and you just, you know, you um, infuse it into your base oil, that you're going to get a lot of great characteristics. But if you were to use the CO2 extract, you're going to get 180 times um, greater concentration than you're going to get when, than when you um, either distill it or then you, when you tincture it or when you um, infuse it into an herbal oil. And this is according to Ron Guba. He's out of Australia and he's done a lot of research with CO2s. Um, so let me pass around the calendula. And it is another one that's going to be solid. So it's not going to come out. Let me turn it over. And you know calendula is from the marigold. And look at this rich, rich orange color. So we have calendula. 
um, you're going to want it in the total and you're going to do the same thing. You're going to use the water bath. You're going to heat up your oil, whatever oil you're going to um, put it in and your CO2 extract at the same time. So they're the same temperature and then they will disperse well. Okay. And these are your, um, it's another one that's going to be a super anti-inflammatory um, uh, oil. And it also is another one that's going to be great for all your skin ailments. So your eczema, your acne, your dermatitis, warrant, uh, burn, burns, wounds, and ulcers. So it, it again has that great affinity for the skin. Okay. So here's our um, breakdown. So we have almost 3% is essential oils, which is rather surprising. Um, but then you can see the other ones that we have. I wanted to share two just uh, case examples from my thing, and I only have a couple minutes. So this is a lady that's 64 years old. She had IBS and ulcerative colitis. She had um, had bloody stools, cramping, bloating for over 28 years. She'd been to multiple doctors. She was usually hospitalized at least once every two weeks or once every week because of her condition. I put her on these capsules. Everything was regular essential oils except for the ginger. I used the CO2 extract. After doing this presentation, I think I'm going to switch out my German chamomile for, um, I'm going to switch out my Roman chamomile for German chamomile CO2. <laughs> I just, as I was going through, I thought, oh, you know, that would really improve this. So this was my recipe. I used it within 90 days. She no longer had any diarrhea, obviously no bloody diarrhea. She was no longer um, cramping. She was no longer bloating. She'd only been hospitalized once in that 90 days. I've been working with her for over four years now, and she's never been back in the hospital since. She's only been in the hospital once since I've known her in that time. So it made a huge difference in her life, and she is probably my biggest advertiser. <laughs> she goes out and tells everybody. <laughs> Here's another lady. She's 72 years old. She has lichen sclerosis on her vulva. She it was a big, bloody, open wound that was very painful. Um, I have just a standard wound healing cream. She was using it, and it started to close up that wound. And it felt better for the most part, but the intense itching, it didn't touch at when I added the German chamomile, because remember we said it was a strong antihistamine, when I added the CO2 German chamomile, the itching became very, it did not totally go away, but it became almost non-existent. It still bothered her slightly on certain days, so it made a huge difference. So what have we learned? We found out about CO2 extracts, what they are, how they're made, some of the major differences between them and essential oils some of the advantages and disadvantages of CO2 extracts, how select CO2 extracts are very similar to essential oils. And lastly, we found out and explored a few CO2 extracts and found out how to use them. Here are the references. A lot of this was orally that I had been taught in class, didn't know how to reference my notes, so they aren't referenced. Um, but those are the references. Um, this is the book that I use the most. Um, this just came out a couple months ago. This is from Madeline Kirchhoff. She's out of the Netherlands. And it's the most expensive book written on the market as of today on CO2 extracts. Um, you can get it through Amazon. You can also get it through Nature's Gift. So I have that. I have some essential oil booklets that are from AIA. So if you're interested in having one of these, you're welcome to it. If you'd like some information about Alliance of International Aromatherapists, and you're interested in becoming part of our organization or supporting our organization or the research, here's some flyers. So that concludes it. I pray we don't have time for questions. Yes, Gordon. I just have one question. Sure. Um, I mean, I'm really interested in what you said about um, the actual process of CO2 and the result of a product. Um, you know, like when you distill, mm -hmm. you have to alter the process of distillation depending on the specific plant. So, for example, if you're distilling Paris Sage, you want to distill for a long period of time because the diterpenes 
are very slow to come across. Slow. Um, whereas with lavender, you know, the lunar lactic note and, and the lunar laurel are going to come across quite quickly. So, have you noticed um, that that's the same? In well, it's not the time, it's that temperature and pressure. Right, I understand it's not the time, but would the temperature and pressure be different for different plants? Yes. And see, and that's why we don't really know what is right. the most ideal. If you need more of those, I have more of those up here. Um, yes, and so there really needs to be a lot of exploration and experiment with all of that to figure out what is the most ideal temperature to run it at, what's the most ideal pressure to run it at, to get the greatest amount of therapeutic properties right. coming through. And it would be plant specific. Right. It would and be. I also wondered with the Will they not GC MSs? It's an HPLC uh, analysis. I'm right. sure I missed. Um, is that would be lock specific? It should be, yes. It should be. So Just like your CO2 right. should so you're be. You're not always going to see that same profile. profile. No. Right. And it, it will be different on the plants from year to year just right. because of the growing conditions. Just like the right. So all of that will be, you know, one at a time. Thank you.